Welcome to the Broadway Drumming 101 podcast. My guest today is Gary Selickson. Thank you for being here, Gary. My pleasure, Clayton. Thanks for having me, man. I got a question for you. I really don't know. Where are you from? Are you from New York? No, I'm from West Orange, New Jersey. Oh, really? Yeah, which is about two miles maybe from where I live now. Aha. Uh -huh. Do you have a lot of family out there? Um, no, not anymore. My parents have passed away. Uh -huh. um, so, but interestingly, interestingly, I wound up here because it was a place uh, we wanted to, when we moved out of New York City, we wanted a place that was like an hour or less commuting in because my wife at the time was doing a nine to five gig in the city. And the thought of going any further than that was impossible for her. And of what course, got you? Me, work, me working in town, I wanted to be close to. And South Orange is a great, South Orange Maplewood, a lot of people know, there's a lot of uh, Broadway people out here. It's a good place. Do you, see a, do you see a lot of Broadway people when you uh, commute to the city? I, I really do. <laughs> there's probably, probably about, you know, on any given night, there's probably 25, 30 people on various trains that are going, that are making that trip, maybe more. Wow. Yeah, a lot of, a lot of stagehands, some actors, some musicians. What got you into uh, playing drums? Did you always, you know, you know, some of my colleagues that are older, older than me or as old, because I'm old, <laughs> no, they're playing on pots and pans. Did you, did you have yeah. some kind of inspiration? Like, what was the thing that brought you to playing drums? Uh, I was, I was the quintessential kid that pulled the pots and pans out of my mom's kitchen cupboard and was playing on the floor with, they gave me wooden spoons and I was really doing that. Uh, that's how it started. And my father um, noticed that I was into it. And so he bought me a toy, a metal toy uh, snare drum. It was a tiny, you know, like maybe four or five inches metal and a pair of wooden sticks. I can still picture this. I think he, I think I went through one and then I think he bought me another one. I dented the hell out of it. I would play it all the time, just like banging the drum. You know? And then, uh, and there was a series of other drums that he bought for me over the years. I probably started it, I don't know, banging on things at three or something like that, maybe. Wow. Uh, and then it progressed from there. He, my dad definitely nurtured it. He's not a musician, but he loves music. He loved music. Um, and he nurtured it whether he realized he was going to turn me into a professional musician probably if someone were to tell would have told him hey you better quit this you might become a musician he may have stopped. <laughs> i don't really know maybe not maybe not. um but yes it, and uh he was actually what happened was i kept he kept buying drums you know then there was like a little paper cardboard kind of drum set i got for a birthday one day and it took an hour and a half before i went through the heads of those right um, then eventually he bought a, a Kent, blue Kent snare drum with a stand, and I started taking lessons. And the, the way that came about, uh, he was, his job was as a TV repairman, one of the things he did. And he made the fatal error of telling me one day that one of his customers is a professional drummer. And that guy lived in West Orange, where we were from. And so I was six i believe at the time he told me that in the summer and from that point on i kept bugging my dad it's dad when can i get lessons with mr germansky you know i kept asking him and he his, his stock answer was like i was going to second grade his stock answer was okay well you're going to second grade but when you go into third grade we'll start you can start then and i think he was testing to see if i was really going to be interested at that point and I bugged him so much that what happened was I talked him into letting me start going into second grade. Mm. <laughs> and mm. so the guy, so check this out, the guy that this is Al Germansky. And what my father said was, you know, there's a, I went to his house and there's a picture of this guy playing at the white house with this orchestra. And I was like, that was all I needed to hear. So like, so, I, okay. So fast forward. So I, I talked him into it. I went to the first lesson. And Al Germansky had just retired. So even though he had retired, his ace student, Glenn Weber, who you may know, um, took over Mr. Germansky's teaching practice. So Glenn Weber at the time was probably about 26. 
or something, 27. And that guy, Glenn, who's my good friend, taught me from second grade all the way through 12th grade. Wow. Many years studying with Glenn. Eventually, Glenn moved to his own teaching studio. You know, he got Mr. Germanski's students and then he left. And, and Glenn Weber, uh, I owe a lot to him because he really kind of, you know, he, he kind of just kept me on the right track, like how, you know, you know, prepared me for the little things I was doing in junior high school, kept my interest. Eventually there was all city and all state. And then there was region jazz band and all state jazz band. And Wait, so tell I- me, tell me about this all state thing. Yeah, how did, how did it work in your town as far as, did you play in, in bands and in, in element, uh, like junior high school and. Like what, yeah. Um, right. All... So, yeah. Uh, so I started playing once I was once I was taking private lessons. When I got old enough for there to be like I remember a little orchestra in grade school. So probably like fourth grade or something. I was already playing drums in the little orchestra, and so it progressed from there. And um, I kept studying with Glenn Weber, and eventually Glenn Weber said, you know, there's this thing called Region North Jersey Region uh, Band. You can try out, and what they do is they divide the state into three different areas, North, Central, and South, I guess, and they have, and music students can try out for, for to see where they get placed, and so I got placed in, you know, pretty high all the time, and so I was in Region Band playing um you know in the percussion section and as i got older i heard about the jazz band which was very select and i made the region jazz band and i auditioned for all state i did not get the all state jazz ensemble but i got to play drums in the north jersey regional jazz ensemble which was amazing i'm sure it was terrible but i was good <laughs> enough to get it <laughs> somehow i learned a lot I remember, I remember thinking, oh my God, I'm in way over my head because, you know, was I really setting up the figures like Buddy Rich, like people I heard play? No, but I was getting through it and, you know, trying to hold the band together. I think I, that skill um, that started there playing, and I played in jazz ensembles in junior high school, there was one, in high school, there certainly was one, not very organized, the schools were not very big, Uh, but I got some experience. Doing Did that. you play in any rock bands when you were yeah. young? Yeah. Original rock bands or cover bands or what? Yeah. Again, I was really lucky, Clayton. So my what happened um, when I was 13, my brother, who's six years older, had a friend who was, his brother was a trumpet player in a band in a neighboring town, a band that played like Chicago, the band Chicago and Blood, Sweat and Tears. It was a horn band, right? And he heard from, my brother heard from his friend that his brother is looking for a drummer. And so Ken, my brother mentioned me, I was 13. So I went to that, I went, you know, my mom drove me to this guy's house. It was a band with two trumpets, trombone, saxophone, uh, bass, guitar, drums, keyboard, you know, like Chicago, basically. And they liked me. They were in high school. They were about three, four years older than me. They liked me enough to keep me in the band. That was my first experience. And so we would rehearse like every week, you know, just jamming. This guy had a, a basement that accommodated that. There was drums already there. Or I guess I kept my drums there at some point. That's what it was. The drums were there. And we would rehearse these Chicago tunes, you know, like 25 or 6 to 4 and make me smile. And you made me so very, you know, really playing this music, trying to. And of course, I was trying to learn this in my lessons every week. Um, and then what happened was that band really didn't do any gigs. It was more like a rehearsal band situation. I think we did about two gigs, may or may not have paid anything, like a beach party once and something else. Um, but one of the guitar players at one point in that band, who was four years older than me, was, had a band, a little quartet that he used to play kids parties with. And he asked me, Steve Kaplan asked me, hey, do you want to do this? It actually pays money. And I said, well, of course. Okay, great. I'll pick you up, you and your drums, and we'll go to the, you know. And, and what was popular back in New Jersey and, and where I'm from uh, at that time, this is in the 70s, mid to late 70s, were bar mitzvah and bat mitzvah parties. That's when a Jewish 13-year-old boy or girl, they have a celebration when he becomes 13. And what was in vogue those days was that the kid would get to have his own little party with his friends 
and the parents would have a big party with the kid and all the relatives. But these little throw together parties would be put together. And the band that I played with was a band that used to play those parties. So they'd, hide, they'd get us for little money and we'd play these dances for people. So the point being at age 13 and 14, 15, 16, all through high school, I was playing these gigs and we'd have up, you know, by the time I got out of high school, I was doing like two or three gigs a weekend sometimes. Oh, wow. My other friends would be like, get, where's Gary? Get, what are you doing tonight, Gary? And they'll be playing poker or something. And I'm like, sorry, I got a gig. I'm not going to beat it. You know? Wow. You were working really. Young. I was That's working. Crazy. I was working. And believe it or not, Clayton, from that, um, from that gig, I met a guy whose father was a country music dude who was a yodeler. And he used to play, he had a, I'm not kidding, Idaho Ed. And he asked me, the kid, his son asked me if I wanted to play in Idaho's band. Idaho would play at VFW halls for like firemen's balls and things like that, square dances. So when I was like in 16, 17, I was playing these gigs also with him. So point being, I had a lot of experience like playing, holding a band together, doing these things in a professional way. I wasn't making a killing, but I was getting paid. And that, that I know that that um, all that time playing for people dancing all the time really allowed me to feel fairly comfortable with making a band feel comfortable, I, I think. Looking back now, all these decades later, I know that was really helpful. Did you uh, uh, further... Uh, pursue your education after high school uh, studying yeah. music? Yeah, I went to Hart School of Music. In Hartford, all right. In Hartford. Oh, yeah, yes. wait, are you from Hartford? Because I I'm, heard from, you say I'm from Manchester, Connecticut. You're from Manchester? Well, yeah, I went right to down Hartford. the street. You know, all, yeah. you know all about Hartford, right? Didn't uh, Chris Yankee go there, too? Chris Yankee was there a few years after me. And oh, so wow. Did, so did Clancy. Yankee was there at the same time as John Clancy. Ah... Uh... Wow, small yeah. world. Now, why'd you choose Hart and not Berkeley or North Texas State? Right. I auditioned at the time at Glassboro State, which is a New Jersey school. I got in there. I auditioned at Eastman School of Music. I did not. I got waitlisted there. That was that was a scary audition. I did terribly. The guy, mm. John Beck, I'm sure he's a masterful guy, but he he completely intimidated me. It didn't. I mean, I played okay. I got waitlisted. And then the Hart School of Music, and the reason I knew about Hart was because I was playing in a community orchestra locally and the percussionist, the timpanist in that orchestra, I was talking to him about potential music schools for me. And he said, well, you should go to think about heart. I just got out of there. And I'll leap Alexander Leapak is the main teacher there. And he's incredible. You'll have a great time there. So I was like, okay, Hartford's not nearby, you know, and I auditioned for Leapak there. And from the moment I met Al Leapak, he was like the coolest dude I'd ever seen in my life. And he was in the sixties at that point. He had like a corduroy jacket on. He used to carry a cigar around, not lit, but you know. <laughs> the uh, patches on his elbow too. And Well, no, no, he was cooler <laughs> than that. Dark glasses, you know, he was bad, bad boy. And he was mm. an amazing, he's an amazing, he's, he passed away maybe 15 years ago. He was an amazing teacher, an amazing composer. He played great jazz drums. He played excellent timpani. Emil Richards, the percussionist, is, is an old friend of Lee Pack. Actually, when I got to Hart, I, I decided to go there, and I learned, like, in the first month that Jeff Percaro, well, first of all, Joe Percaro is from Hartford. You probably know this, right? Did you know uh, that? I didn't know that. You know the story? This is an amazing story. Hartford, Connecticut was the home of uh, Alexander Lee Pack, and his two students that were really famous were Joe Percaro, who's Jeff's father who was in the LA studio scene forever and Emil Richards the percussionist a mallet guy they were both the three of them were in the Hartford Symphony together they were fast they were all friends and both of them studied with Leapak and so um, when I got to Hart I learned that wait a minute Jeff Percaro's father Joe was from Hartford and and Leapak I believe is Jeff's godfather that's how close they were <laughs> Wow. So all that blew my mind, you know. Anyway, Hart was a great place for me. Tell you a little story about uh, 
growing up in Connecticut now, I didn't yeah. know anything about jazz until I went to Howard. I didn't study music at Howard University, but I would go to the library and I would listen to jazz records and I'd, I'd just listen to every Miles Davis record and I'd just sit there and listen. But I was kind of introduced to jazz and a legendary jazz musician by accident. I didn't realize who he was until later. So me and a friend of mine would go to Keeney Park and we take our drums and we just jam together. Now we saw this older guy come out with a shake array. This is he, Keeney Park in Manchester or Keeney Park at Howard? Keeney Park in Hartford, Connecticut. Hartford, Keeney. Yes. So he came out and was like jamming with us. He was like doing a shake. He's like, man, you guys sound great. And we were like, get out of here, old man. Not realizing it was Jackie McLean. Oh, that was Jackie. <laughs> Yes, we're like, damn. I guess we, you know, we found out later who he was, and then I learned, you know, how he kind of mentored Tony Williams, I think. And uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I can tell you, I, Jackie was at heart when I was there. Oh, really? Yeah. One of the most incredible musical experiences I ever had was playing a duet with Jackie. Oh, he was wow. Checking me out. He was checking me out. <laughs> Check this out. This is weird. So, so uh, I was playing a lot of jazz at heart. And it's not a big, it's not like, it's not as big as Eastman School of Music. It's certainly not nearly as big as North Texas. It's a pretty small program. When I was there, there was probably about 20 percussion majors, maybe 15, actually. The other five or seven of them were education majors. Um, so after like two or three years, I kind of became a big fish in a small pond, meaning that I was playing in the jazz ensemble. I was playing it with Paul Jeffrey, who had like a bebop jazz ensemble. I was playing a lot and I was pl playing with a lot of friends of mine who are now great jazz musicians, professional Saul Rubin and other people. And I think at one point, and I was taking Jackie McLean we used to teach jazz history classes. I was always in Jackie's class. Jackie knew me, you know, it's a small building. And at one point Jackie says, Hey Gary, what are you doing tomorrow at four o'clock? I was like, uh, what, nothing. What do you need? And he said, I'm, I want to play with you. I'll meet you. Which one of these practice rooms is yours? I point to it and he's like, okay, I'll meet you there at four o'clock tomorrow. I'm like, okay, that's weird. Uh, I didn't really think that much of it because I was so busy with school. You know, like there was so much, I was playing so much. And so the time came around. I was like, wait, I'm meeting Jackie in 20 minutes. You know, we're going to go play. He, he has his alto with him. We walk in, he closes the door. And I don't know. I, I think he just started playing. You know, he's an amazing, masterful, iconic jazz legend. And, you know, he used to sub for Charlie Parker, for those, anybody listening who doesn't know, when Bird would, would, couldn't make the gig because he was strung out with heroin, Jackie was there. They used to call him Little Bird. Ah. Things, he was with Mingus. He was with, you know, Jackie McLean, yeah, is responsible for Jack Jeanette getting with Miles, Tony Williams getting with Miles. Ah. He's known, he was known for finding drummers. So he was clearly, he was like, let's check out what this guy's all about. Anyway, I, we played for about 25 minutes. I wish I would have recorded it. Of course I didn't. And that was it. He didn't hire me for his band. <laughs> <laughs> nothing, nothing like amazing came out of it, except, <laughs> except it was absolutely thrilling. And when he left the room, I was like, holy shit. That's you know, cool. Because it was like jamming with Coltrane, basically. <laughs> It was heavy, wow. heavy. Anyway, you brought him up, so yeah, that's my, you know, that's my Jackie story. so interesting how because he he was just he gravitated towards drummers. It's so interesting. Now speaking of drummers and uh, D Jack Dejanet and Tony Williams, who were some of your influences growing up? Who'd you look at when you were in your teens in high school and in college? Yeah, um, the, I've always had a really wide variety of tastes, and I've done a lot of different stuff, like different styles of music. Um, I can, I, people that come to mind because I did a lot of big band stuff, Sonny Payne with Basie, that guy I really, really, really loved. And there was a record live at Birdland, Basie at Birdland, Basie live at Birdland. That, you know, he, he's a major one for me. I, I was mystified by the way he played, could set up the band and keep it so exciting and like dynamics from, from high to low all the time and just swinging his ass off. That he's one, Steve Gadd, absolutely. You know, when I was in high school and co college, it was all about Steve Gadd. He was playing with Korea, Chick Korea's group, and 
he was on everybody's records, Tom Scott's, you know, as you know. So Steve Gadd was a major influence um, for me. Um, Jeff Bacaro, yeah. Uh, there's many people, man. And through the years, it, it's changed. But when I was, so when I was in college, Hartford is about two and a half hours from where I live in New Jersey. And in the summers, I usually stay up there. But, but sometimes I come home. And whenever I was home, I was a real jazz head during that time. I would always go to the city. I'd get the Village Voice, which was the local paper, and find out who was playing where and go hear these guys. So I heard in the same room many times Elvin Jones. I love Elvin Jones. I heard him many times. Billy Higgins. I love Billy Higgins. Art Blakey. Many times. So I'm coming from there too. You know, like that's a big part of who I am. Um, th those are people that come to mind. I, I used to live, then as I got older, uh, we can talk about it later, but I, when I was on the road, I used to drive around the country and I had a CD player and I'd have these long drives. And so I would listen to CDs. And I, one drummer on the Bonnie Raitt records that I really loved, um, this guy, Tony, uh, I don't know how you pronounce his name, Branigal or something. He's on Nick of Time and, and the one before, after that. Um, but, you know, the, the way they feel, the way the music feels. I love John Robinson on the live Rufus and Shaka Khan record. Oh, man, yes. That, I'm sure you know. Yeah, that blows my mind. But what a record that is, man, you know. So there's been so many. After you got out of college, did you say, you know what? I want to play Broadway musicals. No. <laughs> really. What did you want to do after college? Although if you would have asked me, I would have said, sure. <laughs> you know? did, did you, was that even on the radar back then? Mm, minorly. I had been to a couple of Broadway shows as a kid. My parents, we went to two or three. They're very expensive even back then. But they, then my dad was into that. And so, he, you know, um, I saw a couple. Um, and, I, and he pointed out to me, look, See those guys down there in the or in that hole? That's the orchestra pit. See, he's by the drums. That's the drummer. So he, my radar, he he um, enabled me to 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 notice this, and I never forgot that. You know, that always fascinated me. These days, as you know, it's such a shame because a lot of times the pit is covered with black, and we're not seeing it all. Or we're in the back room. But I digress. Anyway, um, <laughs> so what yes. happened to me? I, I went to Hart and I had this amazing, amazing education with Lee Pack, where I played a lot of percussion. I was a percussion major. I played a lot of difficult classical, modern classical music. I played a lot of jazz, small group, a lot of big band stuff. At one point, I was in five different big bands. Two wow. of them played. Yeah, two of them played professionally. Like, I mean, played gigs. The Valley Big Band. We recorded. And we played all over town in Hartford and up in Amherst. And the other one was Al Gentile, which is Al Gentile's band, which is like a society band that played like Glenn Miller kind of stuff, but he, he gigged. So, and then, and then there was a reading band, which this guy, Chick Chiquetti's an arranger. Maybe you know that name. Remember the 880 Club? You ever go there? Jazz Club in, in Hartford? Oh my God, yes. I think it's 880 Maple, right? Yeah, you're right. Rehearsed on, on Monday nights. Yeah, I forgot about that. Anyway, so I was doing a lot of big band playing, which also I know helped my playing. Um, my point being, so when I graduated Hart, I was like, okay, Lee Pack has, a, has connections in, in Los Angeles. A lot of his students were playing the film music and TV music in LA. And some of his students had gone there. And so I thought, well, I could either go to LA and try that or go to New York or go to Nashville. I didn't know anybody in Nashville. LA I didn't want to go to LA. Somehow in my brain, I thought I really love jazz music. And if I go to LA, I'm going to be missing all that straight ahead acoustic jazz music that I love hearing in the clubs. I didn't know if I could hang as a jazz musician in New York, but I knew that I loved that music. And I knew that there was a greater concentration of that style of bebop, if you will, you know, like modern acoustic jazz. I knew there was more of that in New York. So at the time I thought, you know what, I'm gonna to go to New York first. So that summer I was living in Hart Hartford and an article in Modern Drummer came out where there was an interview with Gary Chester. Gary Chester was a studio drummer 
kind of a contemporary of Bernard Purdy's. He's, he was a white guy, um, kind of like Hal Blaine of New York a little bit. And I read this interview with this guy and he really turned my head around because he was all about the studio scene in New York and some, something clicked in my brain. It was like, you know what? I think I know what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna go, to, I'm gonna go home and I'll call up Gary Chester, see if I can get on his list and maybe through him, I can work my way into the studio scene in New York. That was in 1984. And at that time, drum machines were coming along and the studio scene was going out the window. But I started, he, eventually he took me in and there was an opening and I studied with him for about a year. And he really helped me in a lot of ways, made me think completely differently about the drums. He has, a, people probably know about him. He has a really ambidextrous approach. I'm a natural lefty, but I always play drums righty. So for me, when you study with him, everything you do left-handed, you do right-handed, you sing everything that you play, all these, all these wacky, all, not wacky, all these interesting methods of learning how to play the instrument in a completely new way for me. Um, anyway, about into about lesson seven or eight, he, every week I'd go to his place and after like the fifth, and he would say to me, Gary, what'd you do this week? And I'd say, well, I played for this musical, Pirates of Penzance, where I played the mallet book. Do you know the show? He goes, well, yeah, I know the show. And I was telling him about the mallet book and how difficult it was. And it is a really difficult mallet book. He's like, okay. And then I would tell him, and I did this gig on drums and that thing. And he always wanted to know. And one day after about eight lessons or so, he said, man, you're going to have to figure out what you want to do. Do you want to play percussion or do you want to play drums in New York? Because what's going to happen to you is you're going to get on a gig and it's going to be like a high profile gig and there's going to be contractor, a contractor there and you're going to be playing percussion and he's going to say, oh, you're a percussionist. And then if you try and tell him, well, I play drums too, he's going to be like, yeah, uh, okay, I see you're a percussionist. So Gary Chester's advice to me, which wasn't the best at the time, was like, you have to make a decision. And uh, I did make a decision that I wanted to play drums because I preferred it. And part of me felt really good about, okay, now I don't, now I don't have to practice marimba anymore. You know, I don't have to worry about all these notes. And so it worked out great. But the, you asked how I got into Broadway. So shortly after that, after making that decision, um, one time I went into a lesson and he stopped the lesson. He said, okay, um, you ever think about playing on Broadway? And I said, well, I guess I've thought about it, but I don't really know how to go about it. He said, okay, here's what you're going to do. My student, Howard Joins, you know Howie? He has a Broadway show right now. I'm going to tell him that you're going to call him, and I'm going to tell him to put you on his sub list. I'm like, what? He's wow. like, yeah, that's what's going to happen. My lesson was like on Tuesday. He said, you call Thursday. <laughs> call, call Howie on Thursday because I'm going to see Howie tomorrow. I'll tell him. And that's what I did. I called Howie. Never met him before in my life. I said, Howie, it's Gary Selickson. I'm Gary Chester's student. And he says, oh, yeah, Howie, uh, Gary Chester told me about you. I don't have any room at all. But if you want to come watch the show, you can sit next to me and watch the show. If, you want, if it's something you think you can do, take home the book learn the show at some point i might need you that's what i did okay so this is a good story so <laughs> i'm wondering so, if he ever used you but go ahead okay so so i went to watch and it was the king and i and um the way it was set up in the pit was he was at the drums here and the stage was work was in front of him he was looking at the stage directly at the stage and i don't remember the theater i want to say it's a broadway theater but i don't know um, and he was high up and the stage was not that high, not much higher. So the lip of the stage was right in front of him. Where I watched Gary was, I mean, where I watched Howie was facing him underneath the stage, right? So he's playing here and I'm watching directly opposite. And I, I watched the show and he says, okay, do you think you can do, you want to learn this? I'm like, sure. Here's the book. Call me when you have it down. And I was fresh out of college. I was on my, I was studying with Gary Chester, doing all this ambidextrous wild shit. I was like, this is not hard. I can learn this. I learned it. And I called him in a couple of weeks or whatever it was, three weeks. He said, okay, great. I don't need you, but 
just know that one day I might call you on a Tuesday to play Friday night. And I was like, okay. About four months went by. He called me on Tuesday because that's how he does it. He calls he gets <laughs> the subs in the beginning of the week. He said, can you play Saturday night? And I said, okay. I said, yeah, I can do that. <laughs> so at that, from that point, of course, I was like, holy shit, I'm going to do this. He said, okay, good. Come watch. Why don't you watch Friday night again? And then it's your Saturday. I'm like, fine. Watching Friday. I'm like, I, I can do, you know, I already knew the show at that point. I thought. Oh no. Um, so <laughs> yeah. Ready? So, so um, Saturday rolls around and at about five o'clock, it's an eight o'clock show. At about five o'clock, I enter the pit. And the other one had just ended 20 minutes before. And I'm thinking, okay, this is great. I got two hours easy to relax, get used to his drums, blah, blah, blah. I climb up on his drums. I sit down at the drums. First of all, he sits about a foot and a half higher than I do. At, the, at that time, he did about a foot higher. And and the book for King and I is a lot of two beat stuff. It's kind of orchestral. It's beautiful symphonic music. There was a set of bells, I think. There was um, some wood blocks, a set of bells, and you know, a small drum set with like an Indian tom tom, a Chinese tom tom. So I sit down at the drums. I'm like, oh shit, this is really high. Then I go to play the bass drum pedal, and the pedal was so tight, Clayton. To this day, I've never felt anything remotely <laughs> that tight. It was like, <laughs> I'm like, holy shit, oh, what's going on here? I'm freaking Wait, out. That was the first time you played his drums? Yeah. Oh, my God. Which is a valuable lesson for everybody listening. <laughs> anyway, so I'm flipping out at this point. I'm like, holy cow, this feels nothing. Everything is so different. I'm a foot higher. The pedal, like I have to play quietly, like a piano or mezzo piano, boom, just feathering. Everything was like difficult. And then what happens next is the worst part of it. So I'm about four minutes into playing and I'm not playing loud. I'm just touching stuff. Bing, bang, boom, 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 you know, ting, just to see where stuff is. And I hear <laughs> the pit door opens in front of me, right? And this woman comes out. She's a dresser. She looks at me. She's completely mad. She's like, who are you, what are you doing here? And I'm like, well, I'm Gary Selix, and I'm going to play drums for the first time tonight for Howie. He goes, you can't be here now. People are sleeping. Yeah, I was about to say you people are sleeping. can't make any noise. You <laughs> have to leave. You can come at 7.30. Oh, my God. Pat Clayton, for the next hour and 45 minutes, I walked around Midtown getting more and more nervous with every step. I, I was like, what am I? I was losing my mind. Anyway. I go back at 7.30, I play, you know. Oh, then the next thing I have, I'm like, I'm freaking out. Because now I know I can't make a lot of noise because, there's, you know, there's the house is filling up. I'm like, I know the show. I've learned the show. I can play the show. I'm on my game. It'll be fun. Next thing that happens at about two minutes to eight, the conductor comes through that same door. He looks at me. I'm like a little kid, you know. I'm like 25. He's like, who the hell are you? It's Saturday night on Broadway and freaking Neil Brenner is the star of the show. It's his oh, big Oh, man. Dig it? So he comes through, you know, and he looks at me. He's petrified. I never met him. I Now I know maybe if you have an opportunity to meet the music director, you should say, hi, just so you know, I'll be here Saturday night. Gary. Nice. You know, just, just to get anything going on. Anyway, he looks at me. He keeps walking. He's on the podium. Next thing I know, basically, he's tapping the baton. It's like we play an overture. And I'm like, I got through the overture. It was an out-of-body experience for the next two acts. And I got through. Everything was cool. I made the cut. Okay, good. But when Yul Brenner came on stage, and he was like right in front of me because the lip of the stage was probably about, I don't know. He's, he's pretty tall, and he was wearing this regal red suit. All the lights are on him. King of Siam, you know, and he's in front of me. I wasn't prepared for that either. And he looked at me with like his cold, steely eyes. Like, if you mess up this show, dude, I'm going to have your head. You know, I was getting all this. Stuff. Anyway, it was trial by fire, Clayton. And that's my first show. That was my first experience on Broadway. And I learned many lessons. <laughs> Number one, meet the musical director. Number two, practice on the drummer's drums. 
Well, no, I would say number one, now every time, from that point on, anytime I sub the show for somebody else, I would say, can I just, while I'm watching on the break, I, can I, I, I would ask, can I just sit here for a minute? I just want to feel where things are so that I know when I go home and put the kit together, I know what I'm up against. I know what it's going to feel like. Mm-hmm. That, that, because you know, it's like driving a car and you, and you can't move the seat or you can't move the mirrors. Or right. It's just like that, man. And yeah, that was number one. Number two is if you can um, somehow, it's all about, you know, one of the things for me I, I've learned through the years, it's all about making sure people are comfortable and making the band feel good, especially making the music director feel like you're paying attention to him. Oh, yeah, that's or, or her. one of the many questions I have coming up. Okay. So I'm, I'm, that I'm that was your I, first first time subbing which is something interesting which i always ask people like what was it like subbing on your first show a lot of people yeah may not have necessarily sub but that's one of the many stories that i hear uh right. that was in what year was that 1985 or four wow I think it was 84 what uh did you sub at any other shows after that like what was your yeah so uh, real it's really interesting that happened and I never played the show again. I don't know why, but I know that I was approved. So how we said, you know, we could ask him, at a, you can ask him at a later date. No, I think I was approved, but the word got around really fast that I was successful there. And I immediately started subbing for Tom Oldekowski. At that time, Radio City Music Hall had a summer Disney show. And I started subbing for, for Tom there immediately, like weeks later. Tom, nobody wanted to hire me. I mean, well, Tom, Tom was one of the first people I called before I called Howie, actually, because Tom went to Hart also. Oh, wow. So we had the same teacher. So when I got to New York, I called Tom right away. I said, hey, man, can I sub for you? And he's like, ah, he, he was kind of putting me off. But once he knew I was successful for Howie, then all of a sudden the gate was open for Tom. So I played a bunch of shows at, 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 the, at the music hall which was completely different because there everything's on a click. Wait, Very so he's been doing that show since the eighties. Um, what's, what was the question? He, he, you, you talk about radio city music hall, right? Yeah. Tom was, uh, Tom has finally left about two years ago. Really? Yep. Oh, wow. But for a long time, they did not, they stopped having a summer show. So Tom, so it would only be the Christmas show, but he held that chair for, I don't know, decades. Great drummer. I love Tom Oldcastle. Yes. I want to go see him do that show. It was 2006, actually, which brings me to something that we did together. I was uh, in between shows. I didn't know I was going to get another show after that, but I was trying to find sub work, and I got in contact with him. He said, yeah, look, man, this is not like your regular gig. This is totally different. Uh, you can come down and check it out. So at the same time, I contacted Buddy Williams to to – sub for him at the color purple right. so i was learning the color purple which is in more of my wheelhouse than radio city and i was watching tom play and you know playing in radio city and watching all these people and little people running around and horses and <laughs> skaters i'm like what the fuck is this <laughs> and then I, I got to play the groove stuff with trying to emulate buddy williams i was like buddy williams or radio city so i did radio right. city i mean i did color purple and that's where i saw you play no, actually, that was the first. No, I would never did color purple. No, that was Damien. Sorry, yeah, Damien did the percussion on the first color purple. Right. Watching you play on Motown, right? With percussion. Buddy. Yes, that was yeah. the first time we played together. I but anyway, I, I I digress. Eighties, you were subbing at Radio City. All right. So what? I, okay. Yeah, I'll tell you how it went. So I started subbing for Tom, and then after that. Uh, Howie was Howie had gotten Little Shop of Horrors. I guess King and I closed. Little Shop of Horrors was downtown in the first theater on Second Avenue there, and I subbed a lot for him there. I subbed at Radio City. Um, was there anything else at that point? Those were the two, and then and it was only for uh, maybe six weeks, five weeks of that, maybe four. And then I got a call to go on the road to replace somebody on the national. It was a bus and truck tour, a national tour of On Your Toes, a show called On Your Toes. The drummer who was on the tour was more of a percussionist, and there was some big band stuff happening, and 
that they weren't happy with that aspect of it. So they needed somebody really quick. So Red Press, who I didn't know, called me and said, I got your name from blah, blah, blah. Can you go out of town? And at the time, I was still studying with Gary Chester. And he, I, he, it sounded great to me, you know, like 20 cities for over the course of like 14 weeks or something like that. And I said, yeah, man, I think I'm interested. I would love to do this. And I went to my lesson the next day and told Gary Chester, who every week he'd ask me as I showed up from LA, so what's new, man? What'd you do this? Expecting me, expecting for me to say, well, um, I have a record, uh, a jingle date with, you know, Coca-Cola this week. But instead I said, actually, I got a call to go on the road with the show for 14 weeks. I'm really excited about it. And he freaked out. Gary Chester freaked out. He's like, you can't leave town for 12 weeks. I'm like, uh, why not? It pays three times more than what I'm making now. At the time, I was playing a lot of club dates, weddings and bar mitzvahs and society gigs all over town, schlepping my drums in and out of kitchens, in the hotels, double parking your car, bringing the drum, you know the deal, in a tuxedo in the tri-state area. I loved it. It was a good band. I did a bunch of it. It's fun. But here, all of a sudden, I have my own Broadway show, in effect, and there's somebody else is bringing the drums around. I'm just set them up and play in Scranton for a couple of nights and then we go to Milwaukee and it's on the bus and you know the whole thing sounded great to me and Gary Chester was like no don't leave town never leave town for more than four weeks I'm like wow wow I've already told him yes he said no I don't think you should take it man because if you leave so his so here's what here's what his point of view was he was a studio guy that used to work sessions from like 10 to 1 2 to 5 7 to 10 whatever three or four a day and once you get on the list of radio, you know, once you're on people, the contractor's list of someone that can do the gig, you get that much, there's that much work. And he was grooming me and his other students for that. The problem was drum machines had come along and all those jingles were now being done by machines, which he didn't really realize, I think. So his advice was, Gary, if you leave town, when somebody calls you and they hear you're out of town, they're going to go on to the next person. You're going to miss your spot. And I was like, but, but I haven't done any of this work and here's $1,400 a week, you know, plus per diem or whatever it was. And I'm done playing hotels. You know, this is great. So I went against his will in a way, not that he was holding me to the fire, mm -hmm. but his recommendation. And he told me, he said, man, here's what's going to happen to you. You're going to, and he loved me as a student. Sorry, I'm having trouble hearing That's my watch. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, um, he said, he said, I think what's going to happen is you're going to do 12 weeks and it's going to turn, you'll see, it's going to turn into six months. It's going to turn into a year, it's going to turn into a year and a half, two years. Well, guess what, Clayton, after four, after the 12 weeks, they extended in, they, add, they tacked on Toronto for a month and Detroit for a month. So suddenly it was eight more weeks and I had to call up Gary and say, uh, Gary, I'm not going to be back because you were right. And my last week or second to last week in Detroit, I got a phone call from a friend of mine from college, John Han, who was on the road with Dream Girls, they were about to go to Japan. The percussionist was leaving the tour, and John was like, "Hey, man, we're going to Japan. Are you available? Do you want to do you want to play percussion on this?" And I think the drummer's leaving in a few months. You can move over to the drum chair. I was like, "What, Japan? Another?" And I was like, "Yes, I'm going to do it." So, point being, I went on the road with that show, <laughs> right on your toes. I wound up being it went from 12 weeks to about 20. And then immediately, seamlessly into Dreamgirls, which was 14 months, including Japan. Um, then that came to New York to play a little stint at the Ambassador Theater. They thought it was going to be a stop on the tour, but we got such a slamming review in the Times. And at the time, the New York Times critic was all powerful, Ben Br uh, Frank Rich. He gave us such a great review that the show wound up running for six months. So after being on the road solid for two years, Clayton, I came home to my own Broadway gig on percussion playing Dreamgirls. Oh, wow. Isn't that crazy? And then, so that was like another year. No, I don't know how long it was. I, I think a year or so. And then, so that closed. That was my first Broadway show. Dreamgirls? Dreamgirls playing percussion. It was the revival of Dreamgirls. Ah, wow. Who was on drums back then? Um, at that point, it was Steve Singer. Before that, it was... You know Wally Gator? Did you know Wally? I heard the name. He was great. He was Lionel Hampton's drummer for a long time. He was oh, a, he's a, kind of kind of a big guy, right? Big guy. Yeah, I, met, I think I met him once. He's such a great drummer and a sweetheart. He was the original drummer. When I got to the tour, he was the man. And then he left. 
and Steve Singer took over. You know Steve Singer? Yes. Took over on drums. And so I never got to, I would sub on the drum book in, on Broadway. But my chair was a lot like the Motown chair. It was vibes, percussion, vibes, timpani, tambourine. It was just one percussion instead. So what year was that? That was 87 when it was on Broadway, but 86, 87 on the road. So it was, it was on your toes, 84, no, 85. It was 85, basically, into 86. And then Dreamgirls, 86 through 87. Then Dreamgirls closed, the tour stopped. And at that point, I thought I was done with Broadway. I was like, you know what? I don't want to do this anymore. I was in a rock band called Chillers. We were trying to get a record deal. Never did. I don't know why that's happening. Uh, anyway, my phone thinks I'm talking to it. <laughs> um, so we never got a record deal. And I tried to like, I didn't want to play on Broadway. I thought, nah, I want to be more of a rock. I want to be more of a drummer. Broadway seems, you know, I'd been playing percussion. I was like, in my brain, my twisted way of thinking when I was 26 or something, I was like, you know, let's leave this alone for a while. Until one day I got a call. I was living in Jersey City and... Mel Rodman, who was the contractor, who, would co who was contracting Cats, and then Les Miserables and Miss Saigon. He had all, he had like all the Le Andrew Lloyd Webber, Cameron McIntosh shows, which were huge at the time. He needed a drummer to do one of the Cats tours. He said, you want to go on the road? And I said, you know what? I do. I just bought a car. I had enough for the hotels, a rock band, nothing was happening. I wasn't subbing. I was like, okay, I'm going to do this. Solid money my new car and was national national tour so it was at the time at least a week or usually two or three in a in the city i loved it and i i did a year of cats in 1988 and then the drummer on the les miserables tour had to leave the same contractor was hiring for both tours i called mel after a year of the contract and said you know what i heard Gary Tillman is leaving the Les Mis tour. Do you, need, you have anybody for that? And he said, you know, as a matter of fact, I don't. I said, well, do you mind if I move from Cats to Les Mis? Because I love being on the road. And I did that. That I wound up doing for five years. So I, at that point, it was a year of Cats. Five years of Les Mis. I met my wife after about three years. Uh, we got married five years after that, seven years after that. Um, then from there, Miss Saigon tour opened up and I went from Les Mis directly to the Miss Saigon tour, which was doing even longer stays. I was on the road for nine years solid. Wow. A year of Cats, five with Les Mis and three with Miss Saigon, basically. And then I came home. So when Gary Chester said, you know what, Gary, if you leave town for more than four weeks, you're going to be gone for a year or maybe longer. You know what? He was right. First it was, first it was a year and a half. Then I was home for a year or so. But I came back with a Broadway show. Then I was home for about a year and a half. And then I went on the road for nine years with my car, always driving around. I loved it. Wait, you did the tour? You drove yourself? Really? Wow. Because a lot, of, a few of the guys on Cats, on the, they used to travel the whole band. So there was like 18 people in the band. Out of those 18 people, there was probably 12 or 14 cars. On the Les Mis band, we had a 21 pieces in the orchestra everybody drove i think 19 people drove I, you could do it because you know we'd play kansas city and then they'd have to load this whole giant set for a day and a half into the trucks and the trucks would go slowly traverse the country and i'd be like oh, i'm leaving at seven in the morning or nine or whatever time you know just drive to from des moines to indianapolis or indianapolis to portland or whatever it was i would do it all right this is kind of a uh sorry you asked <laughs> <laughs> going off on a tangent when you toured a lot do you have favorite cities in the united states oh good one um yeah i guess definitely your top five favorite cities oh wow but this is a long time ago in yeah i know things have changed in the 90s. really from the, the 90s to today well yeah, back then I loved, at the time i loved portland oregon i loved seattle Portland had a great music scene. I loved the Portland coast. I had my car so I could, you know, the days during the day when I had time off, I'd, I'd be a little bit of adventurous, you know, and on days off, if we were there for a few weeks. So I'd go to the, I love the Portland coast. I love the jazz scene. I love the music scene. I love the way the people are there. That was in the nineties. I loved Seattle for similar reasons. I love San Diego for the weather. I know you love that too. Oh, uh, yes. Um, you know, I love Austin. 
blows my mind. Nashville, the music scene in Nashville was amazing, is amazing. Those are some cities that come to mind. San Francisco, yes. So you came off the road to do a show in New York? No. I can't. So in 90, my dad died in 96. I stayed on the road um, for about another year. But all after my dad died, my mom was here by herself. And I was like, you know what? In the back of my mind, I was like, I, I better. I'm here. I've been traveling for, you know, better part of nine years on the road. Maybe this is enough. And all through the hour, all these years, I was like, what am I going to do? Am I going to go back to New York? Am I going to relocate to LA? For a long time, I thought I would just move to Hawaii, seriously, and just play jazz, like get a trio gig, and just because I love to swim. And I was a vegetarian. I was like, why not just move to Hawaii and by myself? I can really healthy lifestyle, play jazz in a trio or whatever, and live there. <laughs> but so my dad died, and I was like, you know what? I got to figure this out. First stop, New Jersey. Maybe I'll check out New York. And Clayton, I'm not kidding you when I tell you that the phone rang as I was pulling in the driveway. It was Bob Billig. Um, Chicago, the show had just opened up, and Bob Billig was the conductor and supervisor on Les Miserables. So he knew me pretty well. He knew I was coming home. He's like, are you home yet? And I'm like, I drove, literally pulled in the driveway, and my mom's comes my mom comes out and she says gary does it hi there's a phone call for you somebody's on the phone bob billig it's the like the second word she said to me after i'm so glad you're home i was like okay bob billig i, answer, I pick up the phone and bob says when are you coming home i'm like well i just got home he said well you know i need we need a sub at chicago are you interested in doing this it'd be great and i said well yes <laughs> and as a matter told, of fact yes so it snowballed from there. I learned that show. I learned Lion King. That was really pivotal. So when you uh, were, what was the show again? The um, first, which, first one, Bob asked you Bob to Bob I know from Les Miserables. So it was Cats. I met Bob on Les Miserables. He was a supervisor on that and also Miss Saigon. So no, what, what did he well. ask you to sub on again? Chicago. Okay, you Chicago. Did you go in and uh, yeah. get on the it. drum set and... Make sure the pedal wasn't. Hell yeah. <laughs> Hell yeah. That's the first thing I did, I'm sure. You know. Yes. And Ronnie Zito's great drummer. I love that. Yeah, guy. I haven't met him yet. I I, God. I should uh, reach out to him. You should because he's he's legendary. He's you know, he's an iconic New York drummer. Did a ton of session work and mm. he's a beautiful musician. God, so great. His brother is Tori Zito, who's famous for a lot of arranging with Sinatra, Sinatra arrangements and other things. That's his brother. But Ronnie is equally famous, They're equally dynamic, incredible musicians. That's cool. Yeah. You you did uh, Chicago and started your name. I guess got back around and started subbing on other shows. And how did yeah. you how did you wind up? <laughs> you know, we brought it up earlier the Gershwin's fascinating rhythm in 1999. What well, that came from there? me subbing at the Lion King. Ah, okay. Because Cynthia Cortman was was the keyboard, was the associate conductor there. And she asked me if she had the show, Fascinating Rhythm. She was the musical director. She knew that it was coming in. She asked me if I'd be interested in working on it with her. Of course, I said yes. And she said, yeah, it's going to be a Broadway show. And I was like, wow, it's amazing. So it was very short-lived. We played a few weeks. It wasn't well put together. It was basically different arrangements of Gershwin tunes. And they tried to cobble this it really wasn't even a story. It was a review. It's called Gershwin's Fascinating Rhythm. And it, the, it was, I think it was at the Ambassador Theater. No, it couldn't have been. I don't know what theater it was. Anyway, so yeah, it was, oh, at the Long Acre Theater. Basically, it was a review of famous Gershwin tunes sung and danced really well with great cast. But it wasn't enough. It wasn't a high budget. It wasn't enough to sustain it. Did you uh, do workshops for your next show, Aida, or did you yes. wind up getting into that some other other way? Well, I, I was really lucky, Clayton. So I started subbing in Chicago. Then I ran into, literally ran into Carl German, who was the associate on Lion King at a deli. I'd just gotten home. And he said, you're home? Well, why don't you come sub Lion King? And I told him, you know what? I'm not going to, Lion King had just opened up to like rave reviews like crazy. And I knew everybody in town was going to call Tommy Igo 
to try to get on the list. So I was like, you know, I got to learn Chicago. I'm not even going to go there. I know I'm going to sub it's it Cats and Les Mis and Miss Saigon because all three of those shows I played and they were all still open. And I had a chance to sub at Rent. So I had my hands full. I was like, I've got enough. And Carl, I was talking to Carl in this deli and lo and behold, Tommy Igo walks into the deli. And so I had met Tommy years ago and Tommy says to me, dude, what are you doing, man? You come learn the show. What are you doing tonight? Literally, Clayton. It was Saturday between shows. And I'm like, well, I guess my black clothes are at the, you know, the studio, I, the music building. I go get them. Go get your clothes and come watch me. I'm like, okay. So an hour and a half later, I'm sitting next to Tommy, watching him throw down his book. And he says to me this. He goes, okay, this is how this is going to work. The show is a gigantic hit, as you know, we just opened. I know that I have a bunch of dates that I'm not gonna be here for. I have a couple of subs, but I'm telling you right now, whoever learns the show that Joe Church really likes is probably gonna get a lot of work. And that's all I needed to hear. That night I went home and started transcribing everything that he played. I wrote it all down, um, you know, everything. And he plays a lot of notes. I love Tom. He plays a ton of notes. I learned it all. I went and played a show and, and, and he was like, Joe was really impressed. And so um, I started playing there a lot. And then fast forward, you asked how I got Aida. I was subbing there a bunch, a couple times a week, probably for a couple of months. And Cynthia asked me if I wanted to work on Fascinating Rhythm. Around the same time, unbeknownst to me, Michael Keller, the contractor, I'd call the conductor of the Lion King, Joe Church, and said, who, who do you like on drums there? Who's a good sub for, for Tommy? And Joe said, well, there's this guy, Gary Selickson. He really sounds great. And my phone rang, you know, the next day. It's Michael Keller. So I have this show, and it's, it's, uh, it's Elton John, and it's Disney, and we're going to, it's going to Atlanta for a couple of months. Would you be interested in working on this? And I said, of course. And he said, well, really, you want to leave town? I'm like, for that? Yes, of course I want to leave town. And the timing was such that I could do Fascinating Rhythm at the same time Aida was happening. It was called Elaborate Lives at that point. You know, it, the timing was such that I could do both of them. I did the short run of Fascinating Rhythm. Nobody knew it was going to close so fast. Then I went to Atlanta. Or we started the pre-production work and then we went to Atlanta for the show called Elaborate Lives. They closed that version of it. They, they fired the choreographer and the director. And the new choreographer... Um, this gentleman, Wayne Salento, wanted to start working right away. And so I got called with Jim Abbott and uh, Dance Arranger, and we started rehearsing. And it became Aida. And basically, that's what happened. And my career kept going from there. So Aida was the first time I met you because I had done, I had gotten a a call to work on a show called Footloose, which was yeah, the bus course. and truck tour of right. that show. And I didn't know anything about Broadway at all. So right. I was like, I, I don't know if you were the first person I called, but you were the first person that allowed me to come in and watch you play. And oh, I was that's great. fascinated. I was like, well, what the hell did I get myself into? Because you, you, know, you were doing all kind of stuff in that show. And I was like, I don't a even lot. know if I can hang. But uh, There's a lot in that show especially. <laughs> I do remember one, one the, the, I think it was the musical director who was playing a little prank on uh, Heather Headley. I think he took one of her like stuffed animals and was oh, like yeah. playing with it while she was on stage and he was like making it do all kind of crazy things. <laughs> so I, uh, I, again, I thank you for allowing me to come in and, and oh, man, watch I play. Hope, yeah, glad I did. You helped me uh, start my career on Broadway and uh speaking of uh shows that have started uh many different careers you you left aida or did you like how did you get to wicked after aida like did you okay, so the same the same guy that was the choreographer on aida got hired for wicked and so one day jim abbott you know jim mm -mm. you don't know him he's a good friend of mine i've done a lot of stuff with jim he's a keyboard player uh, he was on i know him from cats so that's was way back to then. Um, he and I did a lot of, we wound up getting dance arranger credit on Aida because we did so much, yeah, so much work on that. And Wayne Salento, the choreographer, 
really loved working with Jim and I. So when Wicked was his next project, he asked us if we would be interested in working on that with him. And at the time, nobody knew what Wicked was going to become at all. It was just another project. So I, I was like, sure, of course. Um, that was 2005, no, 2002. Um, so we started working on it with him and there was a lot of work to be done. And I, at the time, as t in the 2003 area, Aida was, had opened in 2000. So it was about three years plus into the run. It was kind of winding down a little bit. And Wicked was clearly becoming something incredible. So that's when I decided to leave Aida to do Wicked. It was a lateral move for me to go from one to the other. Did you um, do a lot of work um, originating the book or, you know, the drum yeah. part? Yeah, and was, uh, again, was that something that you went out of town for? Or you? Uh... The way, what happened with Wicked was um, we started quietly working with him and his choreographer, Wayne, and his assistant. It would be Jim Abbott and me and Wayne and Corinne McFadden. Uh, for you know weeks a week here a week there they were trying to come up with choreography and Wayne and Wayne's and uh, Stephen Schwartz a composer of Wicked his instructions to Wayne Salento and Jim Abbott who became the dance arranger for the show was that he wanted the music besides his own music his own two you know beautiful melodies and songs he wanted the dance music to sound something otherworldly from some other world. So at the time we were trying everything in the world. We had some loops going and we were trying all kinds of crazy things. And we spent weeks working on stuff. Um, and what was your question? How did, how did that, how did that evolve? Is that what you Yes. Mean? Yeah. So it was weeks, it was weeks of that. And then, um, and then at some point they did, they did auditions. They put, a, they put a cast together and then we did a cast rehearsals where Jim and I were there playing. Actually, Jim was not playing the cast rehearsals. Alex Lacamoire was playing, he was a keyboard one player and associate. And we were playing the rehearsals with the cast and they were grooming the cast to go to do the out of town, which was in San Francisco. And Michael Keller, the contractor told me right away, he's like, look, I can't take you out of town to play drums because in San Francisco, I have to use the local drummer there. And you're not going to get to do the gig. And I said, okay, that's fine. I'm, Aida was still happening, you know? So it didn't really matter to me. Um, great drummer played it there. And his name I can't think of right now, John, somebody. He's amazing. I'll, th I'll come up with it later. Anyway, um, so I was fine. And I was, so I continued to play Aida. And, but I knew that Wicked was really something special. The cast is incredible. The music was beautiful. It was so intense. The story is so intense. I, you know, there's so much of my own stamp in it, in a way. So at one point during I, the run of Aida, when when they were playing Wicked in San Francisco, I flew myself out with JetBlue to uh, to San Francisco to watch the show. I was like, this is worth it to me, to, because I needed to find out if I wanted to do the show or not. I had an open invitation to play the show when it came back to New York. So do I leave Aida and play Wicked, or do I hang with Aida? So I went to watch wicked in san francisco and from the moment glinda comes down in the in the ball or whatever it is um in the beginning of the show I, the people around me were like <gasps> gasping you know like they were completely in it from like minute number two they were enthralled with the show because it's the prequel to the wizard of oz and the, uh, everybody knows the backstory everybody's fascinated christian chenoweth is so amazing and funny and witty and adina was spellbinding and you know the thing is incredible joel gray was amazing Robert. so i was like well this is going to be a hit you know i immediately knew i was like okay so i told them that yeah actually i want to do the show and that's what happened so i talked to uh bill lanham and matt vanderen about wicked i asked huh? bill i was like why is it so yeah, everyone that i talked to is like matt god wicked so hard to play and and uh matt was telling me that you, the way you described it to him, I think, was Bartok meets Metallica or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> it's like well, it's a combination. Uh, I, I guess in a way, I mean, <laughs> I mean, 
you know, with that, well, I guess what I guess I said that at the time. What, what I think what I meant by that was um, Bartok being, in a, you know, a modern classical composer whose music is very passionate and intense and sometimes difficult rhythmically and harmonically. You have to be on your game to play that and be be very precise and play it to the nth degree um, is nothing Broadway showy about that kind of music. And the Metallica aspect, well, you know, some of it gets kind of heavy rock and intense and angsty. And I was playing, you know, some of those songs, you have to because No Good Deed, that song um, and some of the others, it's full on rock. I mean, everything I could give to it, it would take. And, and the drums actually, the drums in, that I was using in the pit at Wicked was a thin shell, four ply, maple, pearl, gorgeous drums. But I remember hitting them so freaking hard and thinking, man, I am topping these shells out. Like, I can't play any more, can't play anything more into it because it's not going to sound musical after that. And I never felt that way with the drum set before. But some of the music in Wicked made me play that intensely. That's my point. So. Wow. You know, yeah, Wicked is really all over the place. There's the quietest little finger symbol and triangle things that you want to be so delicate and it's chamber music like, you know, you're playing with a pretty flute and oboe maybe and strings in one minute and somebody's, you know, crying or emoting. It, the stakes are very high theatrically and, and, the, and Bill Brown's orchestrations in that show are gorgeous. So, and then there's times when you're playing with a lot of brass, it's a big orchestra, 23 piece band, 23 piece band, two trombones, two French horns, two trumpets, four woodwinds, three keyboards, bass, two guitars, drums, percussion, and a string quartet. Wow, I and remember. The way, the, the way he orchestrated it, he really, um, he really uses the orchestration specific, specific moments call for specific little ensembles. And there's a lot of that going on while the intense emotions happening on stage. So some, sometimes I'm like throwing down playing rock. Sometimes it's poppy. Sometimes it's I'm playing br a brush ballad tenderly. Sometimes it's finger cymbals. Sometimes it's bombast tom toms with timpani. You know, there was, uh, there's no tam tam but you know there's some electronic weirdness there's some weird sounds on a pad a lot going on so bill brown speaking of yeah. heart school yeah. of music he was chris yonke's mentor correct yes yes Very much. that's why i think yeah. i heard his name from now wicked came out and you know i looked back at the reviews right and everyone was like this is the worst thing this is this is terrible the reviews are mixed and i don't so, really know Nobody really knows why. Now, it's interesting how back then reviews were supposed to be like, if you got a bad review. Now. Yeah, yeah it was a little bit pre-internet almost 2003 when we opened. Not pre yes. Well, pre-internet, but it was the beginning in a way, right? Clearly they were wrong. <laughs> They've lasted a long, I mean, you know, Wicked's still around and still selling out. Uh, what do you think it was about that show that made it have such uh, staying power? Um, a couple things. First of all, most people know the backstory. Most people know the story of Wizard of Oz, and it's something that speaks to them. So here's a here's a thing being presented that's a, a twist on the story and big time, and also a prequel. And I think people were immediately, you know, you go into the story realizing, oh wait, I'm kind of interested in this because I remember seeing this as a kid. A, the, there's some gorgeous music. The, the actors, the original actors, like. Kristen Chenoweth, they were incredible. The costumes are gorgeous. The set is is really wild and cool. It kind of has everything. There was a famous line that Joe Mantello, the director, said when we first opened. He said, and I think it was in an interview or maybe said it in the theater and people picked up on it. He said, well, at least, he, you know, after watching a, a preview or a tech rehearsal or probably a, a run through, he said, well, at least you know where your $150 is going when you watch the show. Mm. Meaning that you, you see this opulence and you're getting this spectacle. Really, it's not, there's nothing um, 
casual about it at all. <laughs> From the costumes to the story to the performances to the music to the blah blah. blah. I need to see it. I, I I should see it before I start working again. Yeah, I've never seen it, so I need to go check it out. Now I you know musicians in general don't leave shows, especially hit Broadway shows, because we're like, all right, I'm gonna stay here. At least I got a job. It's solid. You took a leap and you left and you did Tarzan. But that's why I left. You know, when you tell me, tell me more. Yeah. So, um, we were playing wicked and then we were about two and a half years into it. I'd been with the show. Basically I'd done about a year pre-production, maybe in about two and a half years of the show, sort of. Um, and one day, I heard Disney, who I worked with, that's they produced Aida, was producing Tarzan. And somebody told me that they're producing Tarzan. And I said, well, who's playing drums? And I p- kind of put in for it and was offered the job, basically. And the way, this is a good story, the way I was offered the job was, I um, at first we just, you know, I was very interested and I was able to, to do a, a 29 hour reading on it. So what that was, you probably maybe you've ever done those where, yep. where they, they'd assemble a small cast and it's Disney. So they did it like with a big budget. So they assembled a small cast and they had microphones set up on mic stands and a PA in a room at 47th street studios, um, a rhythm section. And so I was given, I was, I was asked to do that because it was a similar, uh, Paul Bogave was a music supervisor and he had, was a musical supervisor on Aida. So he allowed me to do this thing. And of course, it's Phil Collins' music. I love Phil Collins. He's definitely a major influence on me. Um, and I was, I jumped at the chance, of course, and I could do it during the day. And I thought, well, if I wind up at the gig, amazing. And if not, it'll be an incredible experience. So I do the 29 hour thing. I get, I hear the demos. And Jim Abbott was involved also. He was going to MD it. And, he, and I said, well, how do I go about this? Because Phil Collins' demos were laden with 10 tracks of percussion, basically, for every song. Because it's Tarzan, and it's in the jungles, and, you know, there's a lot of percussion. Like, how do you want me to do this in the room? And he said, and he said well, just do whatever you can. So I had a drum set. And I had a drum cat. And on the drum cat, I had his samples. I put a bunch of, they got, I had access to Phil's samples. So I put up what I thought was important. And somehow, I, with no percussionist, somehow I was able to play the percussion stuff in the top of the tune. And then when it morphs into the drum kit, I played the drum kit. And if I had to keep a tambourine going or if I had to play some gym, I was playing a lot. I was like Spider-Man. And it was all, and it was on V drums, right? Oh, wow. And Phil Collins was there every hour of that 29 hours. So here's how, here's what went down. Here's how lucky I am and how grateful I am. Uh, so we're doing this and I'm a nervous wreck playing drums for Phil Collins. He's in the, the room here, you know, with 10 people in the cast, if that three other, four other musicians, Phil Collins, a bunch of Disney people. And they're trying to figure this out. There's a little bit of dialogue used as a through line in between Phil's amazing songs. I'm reading my ass off, you know, like on two staffs, the percussion, I kind of made it work. So I I knew what I was going to play so that it would work. I spent a lot of time on it, making it work. So I had the V drum kit with the the drum cat and probably like three or four extra pads and a couple of pedals. It was like electronic madness doing the best I could playing to his sequences or a click i don't remember now i I can't remember i think we played to his sequences but i think feel like there was very little percussion on the sequences at that point and phil was there with his whole rig he had like a rig of keyboards and his keyboard guy there it was fascinating so it was a monday through friday thing on thursday i go into the 10 o'clock rehearsal and phil's hanging out by the drum set and I talked to Phil Collins that week, and you know he's very friendly, very down to earth guy. And Phil's by the drums, <laughs> ten in the morning, before ten, ten to ten, and and he's hanging out the drum kit. I'm like, okay, he's at the drums. This is wild. 
And I said, hey, Phil, how are you? And Phil says to me, he goes, Gary, guess what I did last night? I'm like, I don't know, Phil. What'd you do? He said, I went to Wicked. I was like, you saw Wicked last night? He's like, I saw Wicked last night. I said, well, how did you like that? Thinking that he's going to say, it was okay. He was over the moon about it. He loved <laughs> it. He was in love with Adina. He loved the band. He said, you sounded incredible. I was like, well, man, Phil, really, thank, thank you. Um, but had I known you were there, <laughs> I probably had I known I were there, I probably would have choked or something. But, you know, um, he said, you really sounded great. It was so great to hear you in the theater. And I said, well, Phil, I'm amazed that you, I thank you for the compliment. But frankly, what I'm doing here in the room with you is so much more grooving and it's your music and uh, you know i'm playing so much more stuff he said no man i got to hear you hit the drums i was like yeah but you're hearing me here he's like and this is really i took this is a really insightful thing i'll never forget he said gary here you're playing on electronic pads i have no idea what you sound like and i was like yeah but i'm playing my heart out he's like no 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 i, I have no idea how you sound on the drums he wasn't impressed really with what I was doing, even though I was working so hard to impress him playing all that stuff, you know, in real time, drums and percussion. What he was impressed with was what, how the orchestra sounded and how the show landed and how it sounded in the house to him. Anyway, I was amazed. I was like, wow, he heard me play. Okay. Weeks go by, the 29 hour thing stops. And I'm like, what's next for Tarzan? Well, the next thing I hear is that they're going to do another workshop, but they don't know who's going to play drums. I'm like, oh man, I'm in trouble. And 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 at the same time, moving out, the Billy Joel show, remember that show? Yep. Right? Was playing at the Richard Rogers Theater, and the drummer whose name I can never remember, who's Billy Joel's drummer now, amazing drummer, Chuck Burgey. Yeah, Chuck yes, Burgey. yes. Chuck Burgey was playing drums, and Chuck Burgey was freaking out because moving out got its closing notice, and he loved having a Broadway show. And Chuck Burgey, he was like, we're closing? Well, what's coming in? Somebody said, well, it's actually Tarzan, Phil Collins. Oh, Chuck Burgey no. had replaced Phil Collins on Brand X. So Chuck reputedly said, well, I'm going to call Phil and tell him I want the job. So not to pat myself on the back, but here's how this went down. And I'm not kidding you. Uh, so this workshop of Tarzan's plan, I hear Chuck wants a job. I'm like, well, that's it. I'm done. And and Paul Bogay said, well, I don't know. It's not over yet. And Phil Collins told them, he said, look, I never heard Chuck play in a theater. The only guy I've ever heard play in a theater that I know I love the way he plays in the theater and what he plays, what he brings to the show from a theatrical point of view is, is, is Gary Seltzer. I, I don't care who you put in the band, but I want that guy to play drums. Wow, that's I great. Not, I kid you not, that's how it went down. Luckily for me, because I felt like my head, you know, I mean, I was really flattered and amazed, but at the same time, I knew that Chuck is a great drummer, and I thought, oh, man, Chuck's going to fucking kill me. But luckily, he got the gig with Billy Joel a few weeks after that, so he's been happy ever since. So wow. It, it win. That's amazing. Anyway, so I left Wicked to do that because I, Phil Collins is my hero. There's so much drumming going on. How could I, you know, and I guess I was, you know, at that point, I had one kid now i have two and i was like this will be okay you know tarzan it's a disney show they thought it was going to be bigger than lion king they had really great hopes for it how long did and it last it lasted for 14 months 15 months i probably worked for about a year and a half on it maybe a little more but it was the experience of a lifetime so but I, when that show closed i had no shows and i was stubbing for the next 14 months did you go back to wicked to sub Yes. And what did it feel like? Really weird because I played it the way I played it. And Matt plays a little differently than me. I was like, and I asked the conductor, I was like, um, <laughs> <laughs> can I play it my way? <laughs> can I play? He's like, yeah, you wrote this thing. You play it. And they were forgiving. They let me play my way. And not that it's not <laughs> different. Please. He just had, you know, Matt is a great drummer. He mm -hmm. has a heavier foot than me. He's coming from a little different place mm -hmm. in some ways. Man, I don't know who has a heavier foot than you, man. If, <laughs> I heard you play, man. You, you. Can, it's funny how you have a history of playing jazz, 
but you play so heavily. I mean, you oh. you have a strong feel, whether it's Aida or... Uh, I like to play rock, I guess, you know. Yeah, and then, of course, I mean, we'll get to the School of Rock thing in a minute, and, of course, playing Ain't Too Proud. But, Tarzan, you went back to, to subbing after that closed, and yeah, you did a show called You May Now Worship Me. What's that about? No, I never did that. You didn't do that? Never heard of it. Oh, man. Well, that's on your Playbill <laughs> thing here. <laughs> it's on my bio? You may it's, now well, me? it's in, in Playbill. It's like, yeah, all the things that what? you did. but No, I never heard must, of that. You need to. Like, no, I, I had 14 months of subbing. I mean, I was doing a bunch of stuff, but I was subbing. And then one day I got called to do Billy Elliot, which was great. And that lasted for about three and a half years, maybe longer. Oh, that's great. It was amazing. Um, and my second son was born at that point during that time. Uh, yeah. And then when that closed, that was Elton John and really interesting experience too. Um, very different than Phil, Phil Collins and then Elton John. So tell me about Elton John. Oh, it was Elton your... John, then Phil Collins and then Elton John. Oh, that's right. That's yeah. right. Ah, what do you want to know? <laughs> <laughs> where, you know, there are certain times where, you know, it's funny you mentioned if, somebody's in the audience you might think and play differently it's like oh my god you know hopefully not dennis yeah. chambers is in the house i gotta you know, oh my god uh, one quick story when i was at lady day at emerson's bar and grill you know we played uh we, see that, by the way. we played five songs at the very beginning and everyone was coming in to it's like being at a nightclub yep. and then there's a table right next to me on the left and it's two seats so there was one lady there with a cowboy cow, cowboy hat on, and she was talking to Shelton in between songs, like, hey, Shelton, and he's looking at it. And then this, all of a sudden this woman comes up and sits right down, and I'm playing, and I recognize her. I'm like, oh, shit, that's Tara Lynn Carrington. Oh, wow. So I'm sitting there playing. I'm playing jazz. I'm, I'm, I can play jazz, but I'm not the greatest jazz drummer in the world. So I'm thinking, fuck, she's sitting right here right next to me watching me play so at one point i'm like oh you know i gotta put some extra in it but i'm thinking about so wait a minute i'm just gonna do the gig that i normally do yeah, and i gotta stop thinking about it because sometimes i'd be in the audience i see with marsalis and i'd see this person yeah, and right. I'm, I you start realize. getting subcon self-conscious and i i Listen, don't that show, i didn't realize that that, all, that you're right in the house basically. oh man i'm we were exposed there's four of us on stage and it was great but you know i was great i was behind audrey mcdonald every night and just watching her do her thing i'm like oh my god you got to step up your game when, when you're with somebody of that yeah. status anyway but in general you should always be at the top of your game anyway so i i try not to be too self-conscious but it's kind of hard when you like you know somebody's your hero and they're watching you play you, you yeah. think kind of differently and you really should yeah. because you're doing the gig just like you did uh wicked in the way that you do it and that's why phil collins liked what he heard because you did you so meeting people like elton john and phil collins were you self-conscious that we were you like thinking oh my god this is a legendary you know rock star or were you like oh this guy's cool let me just work with him like how did you approach it well i wish i could say i was that cool as a cucumber like that but not really um with you know with Elton John, I got to play with him two times. One was in one he showed up in the, in the rehearsal room for Aida early on, and we got to, I got to play a shuffle feel with him because he, he, he didn't, we had played it for Elton. He was watching. And he's like, you know, I get not Gary. He, he was sat in the middle of the room, and he's and then he started walking over to the band and he said, actually, I think it should be a little faster. And then he kicked the kicked the piano player off the stool. Basically, he said, Let, can I sit down? And he played, you know a faster shuffle feel and I played along with him. That was my strongest suit. Um, that lasted for about two choruses. Um, and it was incredible. He's a force of nature and when he plays, so, but he, he plays so, he has such a giant feel, giant um, sense of pulse and, and uh, groove that basically he'll take you along. You know, and I was, I was, I was like, well, I'm not going to get in the way of this. So I was just playing some drums to his very strong piano feel. It's like, yeah, it should be this tempo, you know, you know, 20 points, 20 clicks faster. <laughs> that was one time. And then another time on the Today Show, that was really wild. 
um, that I won't get into that. There's a whole story with that, but I will not get into that because it's a 10 minute story. Uh, but, but playing with him is amazing. And for that reason, he has such a strong time feel. Phil Collins. Um, I never got to play with him where he was playing except when he was tapping a pencil on a step on a <laughs> seriously or clapping um, uh, and I wow. with him singing. And that was amazing. And I got to listen to him tapping time with a pencil on the desk or his foot tapping his foot. And I'm here to tell you that he has like the strongest sense of groove. I've ever met anybody I've ever met in my life. Like he can tap his foot, Clayton. Like he, here's a, here's a story. We, he was always, when we were rehearsing Tarzan, there's all this flying that goes around where they have to fly actors. And so it took months of rigging where the people are on harnesses and Disney didn't want anybody to get hurt, of course. So they had to, we took months. And during the 10 week period, I didn't play a note, but I transcribed a lot of stuff. Yeah, I'm not kidding you until the last day. And then even that day I barely played, but I would be in rehearsal. I would be in, you know, hanging out in the room where they were t teaching the vocals and Phil was there basically every day for 10 weeks or whatever, eight weeks, whatever it was always there. Phil Collins was there day in day. Out. He loved it. He comes from the theater. He was a child actor in London and he loved the process. He was always there. He's the nicest guy. He's the mellowest guy you've ever met in your life. No airs about him. No ego. Incredible. Well, often Phil would be in the room where they were teaching vocal harmonies. So the guy would be playing piano and teaching parts and Phil would just be there just to make sure people were not singing with too much vibrato because he knew the music was not going to be about vibrato, you know, even though it's a Broadway show, it's a pop show. He wanted to make sure nobody was learning it correctly. So he would just be tapping time either with his foot on the floor or his hand, just, just, just to kind of help the time in the room, man, the whole room would be swaying. He was so strong, Clayton. Mm. His time feel is so strong. The air in the room felt differently when he was when he would do that. He didn't try to do anything. He was just trying to. He was just like listening and tapping his foot. But the groove, the was so, the pocket was so wide. Wow! Incredible! Incredible! Tell me more about Billy Elliot. I I didn't get a chance to see it. I need to see the actual movie. Did you do the mu movie also? No, no, no. Okay. No. Billy Elliot's an interesting story. That that came to New York after it was already a hit in London. And when it came to New York, um, the album had already come out, they recorded it in London. And so my um, direction was to play what, what was already created. So I had all, you know, I was just to play it as it was. Okay. It was, unlike Aida and Wicked, where there was a ton of Gary in, the, in those parts, there's hardly anything in the Broadway version, not hardly anything. Not too much change for the Broadway version versus what was on the album, you know. Mm. Some new stuff. I played. There's a tune called "Electricity" where I added a double kick drum pedal. I thought that worked really well. Um, there was a few little things. And that, that was a big thing. Oh, that "Electricity" and the song "Angry Dance" at the end of the first act is like a boogie that I played a double kick drum for the last chorus. That was not on in London's version. But the drummer that recorded the album in London is, was not the guy that played the show. Uh, the guy that pl recorded the album is a guy named Ralph Sammons, S-A-L-M-I-N-S, -S, very famous London studio. He's like Steve Gadd. Amazing drummer. He sounded, I just like was like, well, what you played is, like, you know, beautiful. All the big band stuff is great. So there's, it's a big band. There's a lot of brass chorales. There's a lot of like military kind of stuff. There's a couple of rocky things with that boogie and, you know, some some classic kind of Elton stuff, but not as classic, I'd say, as the Aida Elton. Aida that ran Aida. for that ran for four years, right? About yeah, like four years, I think, something around there. Yeah, it was amazing. I loved it. There was a Broadway cast recording, wasn't there? No, only the London cast recording. Oh wow, interesting. And it's great. That's cool. It's a great show. I mean, the story is amazing. They thought it would run longer. They uh, basically they put a tour together. And they thought the tour would do really well. But what happened on the tour was it's a story about um, a kid who it's a coal, in a coal mining town back in the 80s um, when the coal miners went on strike. And basically the whole town, everybody in the town works in the coal mines and everybody, nobody has work. They're all on strike. Nobody's got any money. 
and one of the coal miners' sons is this 12 or 13 year old kid who loves to dance. Who he's not gay, but uh, so he became a ballet ba ballet dancer and he loves it. And the whole story ensues. I won't give it away, but basically what happened with that was the tour was put out. They were start they were going to do like five months in Chicago. Wound up running about six weeks. They couldn't sell tickets because Middle America thought that the show was Billy Elliot, a show about a little gay dancer. <laughs> oh, really? Seriously? And wow. They uh, basically, they couldn't sell the tour because people didn't were not interested in seeing an Elton John show about a gay ballet, ballet dancer. And basically, wow. they poured so much money into that. They lost so much money with the tour that they gave up on the Broadway run, basically, is what happened. <laughs> But they got four years of Broadway out of it. But that's wow. really what happened. That's crazy. Yeah. Interesting. True story. Uh, on to Motown the musical. You played percussion there. Yeah. So Billy Elliot closed. And then I had, again, 14 months of subbing. And I went back to whatever I could and subbed a lot and did a lot of different workshops and things. And, and then Motown happened. Um, because Ethan Pop, the musical supervisor for Motown, I met during Tarzan. He was the associate conductor on Tarzan. So he hired me to do one of the readings to play drums, on, um, which was frightening for me, Barry Gordy in the room. Uh, <laughs> and then eventually they got Buddy Williams, which I'm th really happy about, to play drums. And Ethan said, well, I can offer you the percussion chair. I said, sure, I'll do that. And that's how that happened. Mm. Yeah, it was percussion. Very similar to what I did on Dreamgirls. A lot of tambourine. You were there. You played the yes. A lot of timpani, a lot of tambourine, some vibes, some xylophone. Yeah, I had so... to dust off my mallet chops, and I did. I worked, you know, for months playing scales and reading, getting my stuff to back together, learning how to, the gospel tambourine thing. I, you know. The band uh, was great, man. I used to love great. playing that show. I know, and Roger Squatero was on yes. the single book, and Roger. Yes, I, I love mm -hmm. Roger Squatero. He, he, we were on Tarzan together. He was a, he uh -huh. and Javier Diaz were. The, it was me and Javier Diaz and Roger. When I did the workshop of "Ain't Too Proud," you know, I, uh, it was just me and Kenny Seymour for the most right. part doing you know the choreography and the and right. the music, and then when we had the workshop, it was me. Keith Robinson, uh, George Farmer, yeah. Roger, and Javier. And when I was playing with Roger and Javier, oh, my God. You know, I was playing what I was playing, but when they got together, their energy, they're so tight together. Yep. They just raised it up to a whole other level. I'm like, oh, talk shit. About, talk about Cloud Nine, right? Yeah. Oh, my God. They're just, yeah, Cloud Nine. Yeah, that, that groove at the very beginning. I'm like, oh, my God. Anything. I mean, Rod, those guys are So imagine playing Phil Collins' music. Mm. Jungle vibe. Oh my God, that's something. Oh man, I mean, that's why I took that gig. I mean, it was, it was like, you know, you raised off the floor. You're like levitating. The music was great. Wow. And those guys, yeah, the three of us, we had a ball. Amazing. Yeah, so fortunate to play with them. Amazing. Motown closed, Motown and you closed. went on to School of Rock. I, my timing was great. Ethan Pop was hot, you know, and so he, School of Rock somehow fell in his lap and he asked me if I wanted to play drums on that. We did the workshop and stuff for that. The pre-Broadway run um, and School of Rock was three years, I guess. It was amazing. Yeah, I like that show. I took my kids there and they, oh, yeah, one of the time. guys actually went to, to middle school with my son, Matt, uh, one of the okay. guitar players. I can't remember oh, his last name. One of the kids name. in the band? Yes. The on stage band? That's awesome. Yep. And, uh, it was fun watching those drummers. I remember you would tell me about one of the drummers that Ragov. He's amazing. Yes. He's all over. The, he's all over the internet. He's teaching at Drumio. Really? Ragov is a beast. <laughs> and the other guys were great too. Don't get me wrong. The other thirteen-year-old Wonderkin drummers that were there, you know, Levi and the original guy. Um, I can't think of his name right now. Did anyway, they ever come down and... Uh... Ragov, Ragov is a special... Drummers will, will learn about Ragov from now to the end of time. That's how special Ragov is. Wow. He's got his head screwed on straight. He's been practicing umpteen hours a day since he was a little kid, recording himself and videoing himself since 
since the beginning. There's YouTube videos of him from like age five or four all the way. He's amazing. He's got giant ears. He's humble. He's smart. He's got the right aesthetic. He's all that. I'm a giant fan. I love that guy. He's great. Yes, everything good is with Raga, man. Kill so him. one one last thing, Mrs. Sure. Doubtfire. Yes, here we are. Did that open up yet? I mean, did it actually open and then close? What was the... We got or, three previews in. Three previews in? We did three previews, March 10, 11, and 12. Oh, my God, really? For real. Yeah, and man. I'm playing percussion there again. It's another Ethan Pop thing, so... Ethan likes to hire me, I think, on percussion because if something happens to the drummer or with the train or whatever, if there's, he knows he can slide me over. That's goes, true. So it's, I think for him, it's like, well, he got Gary, you know, just in case. Or I think is Rodney on that one? Rodney Howard. Rodney Howard, he's great, killing it. Yes, he is. Man. Yeah. And that's the show that you're going back to. Yes, I'm working on my mal chops now, baby. <laughs> <laughs> No. Do you have out of all the musicals that you've done? Do you have a favorite musical that you played in, and and why? Um, I guess it would. Uh, it's hard to name a favorite, but I can tell you, Aida has so much of me in it, and it was a thrilling time for me. It was really, really creative. That was a thrilling experience. But Tarzan, as you heard, is a thrilling experience. Wicked is absolutely has a lot of me in it too. That was thrilling, totally. Billy Elliot was. I mean, I don't know. I love them all. <laughs> Working next to Buddy Williams every night, honestly, his you know his pocket and his his time feel. I learned so much playing next to him every night. Yeah, you know, he's stuttering for him too. But you know, uh, yeah, he really turned my head around in a great way. I love that guy. Uh, what advice would you give to anyone interested in playing Broadway musicals? Um, what advice would I give? Okay, well, I, I guess I have to preface it by saying Broadway musicals have changed in the last 15 years. A lot of them, even some maybe one would say most of them are on a click track now, which is, so that's a skill that everybody has. But at the same time, you better know how to, if you want to play on Broadway, I think you better have the wherewithal to, if you're doing something and there's no click there, to know how to hold the band together and be able to listen to your fellow section mates. It's a little different, you know, if there's no click there, then all of a sudden the stakes are higher. And so that's one element for sure. Um, what advice would I give? Uh, as a percussionist drummer, play as much, as many different styles as you can, because you never know what, if you really want to play on Broadway, you never know what every show is a different pocket of, you know, there's different styles. The difference between Rent and Jekyll and Hyde or Rent and Tarzan, you know, or Les Miserables, which I played for five years, is very orchestral. The Saigon, very, like, asian -y orchestral. You know, they're, they're all different. So my advice would be to gain as much musical breadth, breadth as you can. Um, more advice would be really pay attention to the conductor and understand that they have – they're usually the only ones that can see the show from the front. So their responsibility, you have to have that in mind, I think. When you're sitting at the drum chair, even though you're driving the bus, and really maybe the ball's in your court in a way, because the drums supply a lot of heart and energy and momentum to the show, the person conducting, watching the show, playing keyboards, watching the show, has a singular, you know, has is the only one with that viewpoint of what's really going on. So if you're tuned out to the extent that you're not really aware of what the conductor has on his plate in real time, moment to moment. In other words, if you're not really in tune to him to to some high degree, you're setting yourself up for a potential for a potential disaster. I mean, the show could things could be happening on stage. People could be stopping. And you could, or you, you know, you could miss a vamp. That things can really go wrong. It's very much happening. It's conducted in real time. It's played in real time, whether it's a click track or not. Man, it is being played. So you better pay attention to the conductor, and you need to have that skill 
and that awareness to be able to do that. So my advice to you is if you're playing a show, know the show really well so that you can take your mind off the book, look at the conductor, be aware of what he or she is going through, and then listen and play the show. And keep in mind the action and the storytelling because playing a Broadway show or playing a theatrical show is just that. It's not playing in a band with your band. It's a theatrical experience. It's a story being told. And you're a cog in the wheel of the story that's being told in real time. And because you're the drummer, you're supplying the heartbeat, the passion, the emotion, whether it's a triangle as quietly, you know, beautiful triangle note, ting with the orchestra, or if you're throwing down, playing School of Rock with kids jamming on stage in the rock, you know, it's all of the above. There's my answer. <laughs> <laughs> what are some things that... Be on time, that's another one. Oh, yeah, well, here we go. I got other questions. What are things that a Broadway drummer should never do in a Broadway pit? Um, should never do? If you're subbing for someone, be aware of what the environment is when you get into the drummer's space. And if you need to alter it, first of all, don't alter it much, meaning snare drum angle. If you have to change the seat height, Try to get it back to where it was because there's nothing worse than if I get delayed on the train or I'm running in and I get there and the, the first tune is a big tune. And if I sit down, it's like, wait, well, uh, you know, I feel comp that's not cool. It's also not cool to leave your coffee cup, Coke can, newspapers. Don't leave it a mess, man. Don't leave it a mess. <laughs> you, you know, go back to the area. Go back to how you found it, basically. Have respect for the environment. The what are things head. that a drummer should always do playing Broadway shows? Um, be aware of just what I said before, that it's a theatrical experience. You have to know the show well enough to keep your eyes on the conductor almost at all times. You have to realize that it's not about you. It's about the cohesive of the theatrical experience you're in charge of the rhythm section maybe not in charge but you're there to help make that happen be always aware of that have your antenna way out way open what what kind of uh drums do you use and sticks oh. cymbals hits? i'm a pearl pearl endorser for a long time now since now, why, why Pearl and not Sonar or Yamaha or oh, that's a good question. DW? You know, to be honest with you, I had a Slingerland endorsement. Um, and Slingerland, for a few years there, was owned by Gibson. And then Gibson kind of dropped Slingerland. And so when Aida was happening, I, needed, I knew I needed a drum set. I knew I could use Elton John's uh, clout to get an endorsement. And Slingerland could not furnish a drum set for me in New York at that point because Gibson had kind of dropped the ball and wasn't interested. So, and I was already with Promark drumsticks and the, my rep at Promark said, you know, you need drums, man. I know everybody who, what do you want? Pearl Yamaha. I was like, well, Pearl would be great. And he's, he basically said, he said, okay, let me call X, Y, Z and you call him. And that's how it worked. Elton John, and Disney and, the, and a Broadway show looming was enough to, for Pearl to say, yes, great. And you teach too? Great, yes. Did they give you a set or are they... Uh... They gave me a set uh, at... Uh, no, not for free. No. Um, the set that I used was we bought, you know, at artist cost. I, actually, Disney bought that drum set. Then I bought a drum set that I had for myself. I wish I could have kept that Aida drum set because it was great. I loved it. Is that what you have in your studio now? A Pearl no, drum now set? I have Billy Elliot's. I have a bunch of different drums, but the set that you're um, here that now is a Pearl reference series that I used on Billy Elliot that I bought from Billy Elliot. And the drums that I saw you play in School of Rock, they were Pearl also, correct? Yeah, and School of Rock producers wanted to keep that drum kit, which I'm bummed about because I love it. What do they do with it? I don't know. I don't know. The producers have it. It's in a warehouse <laughs> oh, somewhere collecting dust. I don't know. Symbols too? No, those are my symbols. I kept my symbols. And what what kind do you use? Sabian. I love Sabian. I've been with Sabian for a long time. You know, a lot of my colleagues like Sabian symbols. I really man. do love Sabian. Hmm. I don't know. So much, so much variety, and I've never ever run into a situation where I wished I had something that I didn't have. Wow. 
They were really nice to me through the year. They've been great. I love that company. Last time we spoke, you were working on a show that it wasn't a show. It was a, I guess, four show thing on Broadway. Uh, like, I forgot what it was called, Disney on Broadway. Yeah, we just did a really exciting thing. That's one of the most exciting things that I have going on in my life the last 10 years is I get to play. They, they call it, they've called it different things over the years. It's when we just did the first equity union contract show on Broadway since the pandemic closed it down. We did five shows or six maybe at the New Amsterdam Theater called Disney on Broadway, where it's four great singers, the original Mary Poppins, the original Tarzan. It's Ashley Brown, Josh Strickland. In this case, it was Michael Scott. Um, he was a, the Aladdin, current, the current Aladdin. And mm -hmm. Hissy Simmons, who was a Nala and Lion King for a long time. So it's four amazing singers, and we basically play – various rep repertoire from the Disney on Broadway songbook. So all of any of those shows. So we did stuff from um, Hercules, which is a new show that's happening. We did stuff from The Lion King, which was their first show, then stuff from Aida, then we did Aladdin, we did Frozen. Various hits sung really well with new arrangements in a five-piece band on stage. And we've done, I've got to do a version of that with orchestra. We did it with the orchestra, uh, Chicago Symphony, Pops, the Boston Pops, where it's the four singers, a pianist, and me um, with the orchestra Pops. It's been amazing. I love that. that and then, then we also do like the cruise line shows sometimes. The four of us will go out. The singers will go out with a small band, and we do that. It's amazing. I read on your bio, and I'll, I might have read something incorrect like I did last <laughs> few oh, minutes wow. ago, but you played with ACDC? No, not, well, I worked, I worked never, but I worked with, um, the singer, what's his name? Bon, not Bon Scott, he died. Oh, God. Uh. Well, there was a show, a friend, Andy Jones, a percussionist, do you know Andy? The percussionist at Wicked that works with Matt. He was involved in a show out of Chicago called Helen of Troy. They did a workshop and Brian Johnson was the singer with ACDC. Yes, like yes. 10 years or so. Brian Johnson, believe it or not, was involved in writing the book and writing the music for that show. So it's a rock show, and we did a reading, we did a performance of it down at a club in the village. Eden Espinoza was in it, and they had a cast. We did like two performances, maybe, and I got to play with him because he sang. He sang. Wow. He sang on one tune. That That's was amazing. cool. It was wild. <laughs> wild. Now, I thought you got it. You know. I thought you took Phil. Phil. Uh, no, 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 no. He didn't Phil take Rutz, Brian Johnson. Did not take me on the road. I never played. <laughs> I got to play in a concert in New York with him, where Brian Johnson sang two of his own tunes, and I was playing drums. Yes, that's cool. That's it was cool. Great. I have one last question for you. For anyone that wants to find out more about you, where can they find you? Uh, social media, website. Yeah, I mean, I'm on Instagram. I don't pay attention too much. I don't usually post things. I should. I'm on Facebook. My name there is good. I'm on, I have my website. My website is outdated. I, one of the things I plan on doing is getting it together before we start work again in a couple of months. Uh, it's outdated, but I'll, I'll update it. People can find me there, Gary at GarySelickson.com. They can email me. You teach lessons? Yeah. Here and there, I do, yes, when I can. I love it. I love to teach. Uh, the next thing you're doing is Mrs. Doubtfire. When is that going to be uh, starting? Doubtfire, we start rehearsals, I think, for me in mid-October. And then um, we open December 5. Oh, wow. Okay. Coming up. When do you dude, open? Before that, October right? 16th. Oh, that's coming up, dude. Yes, I hope soon. Yeah. <laughs> time is about to go by way of uh, Broadway 24-7. Uh, Basically, right? Yes. A lot of it. It's great. Thank you. Thank you. It's very interesting to learn the backstories of things and, and why oh, you uh, went from certain shows to certain. I didn't know before you got to uh, Broadway, you had done so much touring. That's amazing. I did. I, yeah. And usually what they say about people that go on a Broadway show tour is that, well, you become a touring musician and you're stuck there. In my is that, case, is that the case? Do you think that's the case nowadays? Um, it could happen. I don't know about nowadays. I feel like everything's shifted with COVID and things are really wide open now. There's a lot of different things happening, you know, like 
there's the I think feel like Broadway's changing for a lot of reasons, you know, um, the whole equity amongst it's just changing, you know, people it's changing. Yes, it um, is. So, many, um, many ways. Many we'll ways. see what happens when we come back. Yeah, man. But um, I love touring. It worked out well for me. I, th- I feel like I got very lucky. Right place, right time. But right skill set. Yes. I think, you know, Gary Chester, when he asked me if I wanted to play on Broadway, I think he knew that I might have the right personality for it and the right backgrounds for it, which is why he asked me. I'm not sure. I mean, I don't really know. Is he still around? No, he passed away about 15, 10, 15 years ago. Oh, wow. Okay. But, and you he, know, he... It, it dawned on me about three years into all the touring. I was like, man, you know what? I'm doing this day in and day out. But if I look back at who I am as a musician and like what my schooling was, I'm really in the, I'm really doing the right gig because it's I come from the classical world. I played a lot of drum set and there's a lot of that. And I played with a lot of orchestras and, you know, this is a good fit for me. So I, I feel like I, I got lucky. It wasn't my go-to, you know, if you were to ask me in music school what my hope and dream would have been, it would have been to be a studio musician or maybe a timpanist in an orchestra. Oh, wow, really? Yeah, but the cards didn't, when, it, when I started studying with Gary Chester, I kind of, and he said, you want to play percussion and drums, then I became more of a drummer, and then I think it was kind of pushed in that direction. But I wound up doing everything. I'm playing percussion now, so very lucky, very fortunate, very grateful. That's great. Well, thank you for joining me on the Broadway Drumming 101 podcast and nice talking to you and we will see each other in person. Yeah, man. I can't wait. Sooner than later. Thanks, Clayton. (laughs) I really appreciate it.